this morning in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to begin in verse 19. What I want to talk about this morning is about church. And I reckon some people could take offense to what I'm going to share this morning. I don't think it will offend any of you, praise the Lord. But uh, I want us to talk a little bit about church. And the, the message title this morning is Church is Not a Game. Amen. Church is not a game. I think, and I guess when you look at the Bible, it tells us that there's nothing new under the sun. So at some point, man has always been messed up. Ever since the fall, there's always been problems. But we're seeing as we grow closer and closer to the end of the age, to where the, the age of the Gentiles is soon to, to be over, the, the tribulation that the Bible foretells to bring Israel back to Christ, back to their true Messiah, for them to recognize Jesus as their true Savior is soon to happen. We see that the Bible tells us they would be a falling away, that there would be lack of faith, and there would be a lack of assembling together in Jesus. And I wanted to talk about today, as we see more and more people in church being forsaken. Now, it's not new that church has often been a social club. I mean, people used to gather in church services because it was, when we got together, it was to find out what new was going on in the neighborhood. It was to... To meet new people. And, and, and church was kind of a social function. And, and I, I got to say, I mean, fellowship is part of the church. I mean, there's nothing wrong with wanting to come together and, and see how you are. And I want to I wanna, I wanna see you and talk to you and see how you're doing. And, and that's, that's completely biblical. But there is a heart in the midst of all of that of what true church is. And it is to come into a place of like-minded people. I am drawn to this place. You see, on Sunday morning, I don't have to question what I'm going to do. In fact, my friends don't have to wonder. I wonder if I can ask Lathan to do this on Sunday morning. They already know Sunday morning is the Lord's time. Amen. I'm going to be in church. You know it. And so there's no question about it because this is my priority. This is what I feel is important. I want my children to know there's nothing more important than Jesus. Sad, sad to say, as we hit summer, all of a sudden baseball and t-ball and football and all of these things rise up. And we teach our children, well, this it's football season. You got practice on Sunday mornings. You got, you got ball games. And so all of a sudden we begin to teach our kids that there's other things more important than a gathering and assembling <laughs> ourselves together. And I was raised a different way. I was raised that the Bible says here, and we're going to read it. Let's go ahead and open up in our scriptures before I rattle on too long. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 19. It says, having there for a brethren boldness. And the re reason we're, we're reading this is because I want us to lead into what he is saying. So we have the before uh, so that we take it in context. He says, having there for a brethren boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus. So first off, church better be preaching the blood. Amen? There's a lot of churches that talk about the cross. They even have their name with the cross in it. And they talk about the blood. But this is not what the true church is. The true church is one that lives it. That doesn't just talk about the blood and recognize that Jesus hung on a cross for my sin. But one that actually believes it and walks in it. This is what a true blood cross preaching church should be doing. He says that we enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus. There's no other living way. There's no other way that you can be forgiven, that I can be saved, than by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that's what we preach here. You cannot be forgiven of your sins by coming to church. You cannot be forgiven of your sins by giving to the church. You cannot be forgiven of your sins by anything that you could possibly do. You must repent, turn from our wicked ways, and look to the blood of Jesus alone for our salvation. And it's there alone. And that's where we stand. And so that's where you, when you're looking for a church, that's what you got to be looking for. Is you got to be not looking one for which one's within driving distance, which one uh, has the biggest child daycare, which one has this or that. It's which one is going to feed me truth. Amen. Because no different than when you're going to go to a restaurant 
You go and you find a place that you are going to be filled. Amen? You're looking not for a place that's going to feed you, uh, you know, poison. You don't want to get food poisoning. If you know a restaurant over the over the corner is known for uh, serving bad food and everybody gets sick that goes there, well, I don't reckon you'll be going there very much. You're going to go to the one that is good eating. It feeds you well. It, it, it's what your body needs. And it's the same way with church. If it's not preaching the word of truth, it's preaching poison. And it's poison to our soul. It's to our spirit. I need to, I need to, my spirit needs to be fed on truth. Amen? That's what the Bible tells us in John 3. Jesus says that it, God seeks those who will worship him, those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen? So he says it's the blood of Jesus in verse 19 and in verse 20, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. So he's talking about the cross. And having a high priest over the house of God, it says, let us draw near with a true heart. I come to church to draw near to Jesus. I, I come to church because I want to feel his presence. And I got to tell you, I, I don't want to go to a church that's dead. That's a morgue full of dead people. I want to go to a church where there's a new and living way, yeah. where the spirit of God is, and I can feel his presence, where I feel uplifted. And I feel the truth of God coming into me. And even if it means that I get my feet stepped on a little bit, even if it means that the truth has come and it has cut away at some things and offended me a little bit, I want to leave knowing that those things needed trimmed off. That, that, that God, the Holy Spirit was wanting to, to trim some of those things off of my life and draw me a little closer to Him. That's what the church should be doing. Yes. Let us draw near with a true heart. In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So when we come to church here, I'm hoping to encourage you and I want you to encourage me to keep on following Jesus. Hold fast, guys, to the gospel that you've received. Don't let anybody shake you from what you have, have stood upon. It says, hold fast, verse 25, which is, which is our main scripture. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as we see the day approaching. Now, we have had, and it's still going on in Canada and Australia, all over the world, and even in some states in our own country, they are still not wanting churches to meet together and come together and worship. Now, last year, and I just talked to a man uh, about this a few days ago, but last year we were under a, a, order that forbid us to worship told us that we could not get out and worship the lord all because of a virus and yet there was other things that people were allowed to do but worshiping god and there are some states that still don't want people to do this it was even forbidding them to worship in their home and let it be known this church we've been here 11 years but we have been a church since 2003 we started off in our home for seven years, we met in our home and worshiped the Lord. And we will, were faithful to just as we are here every Sunday morning and Wednesday night. We were faithful in our homes to gather together and to worship. So when we're talking about church, it ain't a building. It's not, I mean, you can have church that wherever you and I are gathered together, we are gathered in the presence of yeah. God. We are considered the church. We're two or more gathered in his name. There is he in the midst of us. Right. So when we come together in the right spirit, God recognizes it as a church. But God tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the order of some do. And this is especially as we see the day, the coming of the Lord, approaching. So that means as we see we're getting closer and closer to the Lord's return, us gathering together more and more is that important because we need one another. I need you to keep me in line. I need you to encourage me to keep holding fast to the faith. And you need me. And so that's the importance of us coming together. Church is not a game. Sad to say there are people who only come to church when it's socially acceptable. 
They only come to church when it's Easter or Christmas time. It's just, it's just tradition. It's become a religion. And we only need the church when it's time to bury and to marry. And guys, that is not the purpose of the church. The church is for us to, to, to come together because I need you and you need me. We need to encourage one another as we see the Lord coming sooner and sooner. And we see all of the times and the signs yes. all around us drawing more and more wicked. Yes. We need each other to hold fast to this faith. Right. Because I can't make it without the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. And you are part of that. Yep. Jesus says, I am the head and you are the body. So that means if you're the hand and that hand gets severed from the body, it has no, it's not able to survive without the body. That hand will lay on the ground and it'll begin to rot instantly. It needs the body in order to keep it alive. And so Jesus says, I'm the head and you are the body. The body is formed of many members. And don't get upset that you're the nose and not the ear. Don't think that you're not important. Because the Bible, Paul would tell us, where would the sense of smelling be if there was no nose? We all have a purpose in this body. Yeah. You have a part here in this church. Yes. Don't think that you're insignificant. Because even though my pinky is probably one of my smallest little members, I kind of like my pinky. I don't want to lose it. Amen? Yeah. And so you might think that you're insignificant, but guys, you're a part of the body. Yeah, right. And we don't want to lose you. Yeah. Amen? So he says, forsake not the assembling together, because the church needs each other. We're all part of this, this work together. Yeah. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting, which means encouraging one another. So much the more as you see the day approaching. Now let's look at verse 26 because we're reading this in the context. If we just read verse 25, we know it's saying, hey, don't forget to go to church. But we read that it says in verse 19, it's talking about the blood, the sacrifice. So he's embodying what church needs to be doing, focusing, holding fast to the cross, not losing our faith and way. But then he says in verse 26, for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. Meaning, if we reject Christ, that's it. There's not another cross coming. It's been paid in full, and so there's not another way. It's the cross, and it's already been done. It's a finished work, and so that's it. And if we reject that way, well, there, there's no other salvation that's given to us. He says, but a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be uh, thought worthy, who hath trodden under foot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an uh, unholy thing, and he has done despite under the Spirit of grace. But we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs unto me, and I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So in the context of what Paul is, I believe Paul is writing this in Hebrews, but the author of Hebrews is writing here, when he says, Don't forsake one another. Keep gathering together. Encourage one another. He says, First off, the blood better be the, set, the foundation that we're standing upon. And then he says, because there could be a dangerous thing of falling away. If we lose our faith now, if we forsake the assembling together, and we're not encouraging one another to keep our faith in Christ, then fear what lies ahead. There's not another church. There's not another body that's going to be able to lead us to the cross, except for that which God has already built the, the foundations upon. Amen? Now let's turn real quick to Acts. I'm not going to share all of these with you for the sake of time. But if you did a, a, it doesn't even take, it isn't even a hard study. If you did a simple word search and began to search out and study the early church, we would see the pattern that the, that the early church had in Acts, that they were continuously assembling together. It was not just because they needed fellowship. It was their lifeline. There was persecution outside. And I got to tell you, you know, when, when it comes to, to fellowshipping with people, I mean, there's people that I know that don't know Christ. And when I'm around them, I, it, it's in my spirit that I know that we're not one-minded. When I'm around other people that are not born-again believers, there is a wall between me and them. And it's an unseen wall, but I know it's there. 
Because I know that, that, that we, we can talk and we can be cordial, but there is a certain point that it's going to come to where they are in darkness and I'm in light. And what fellowship hath light with darkness? And so I can go out and I can shake hands with, with, with the lost and I can tell them about Christ. But in terms of true fellowship, there's only that true fellowship that I find here in church. Because it's there that I'm around people that are in the light with me. And so he says, it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it says, These all continued with one accord. Acts 1, 14. These all continued in one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So we see that the early church, they were all in one place, in one accord. They were of one mind. They all were focused together. They were praying with one another. They were encouraging one another. It tells us in Acts 2.42, uh, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and breaking of bread, and in prayer. So we find that they fellowship. They were in one accord. They met together because it was there that they were of one mind. The early church knew they needed one another. And it was there that they wanted to be. So if we don't miss church when we're not there, we ought to look at our heart and wonder why. Am I so in love with the world that I'm able to be in fellowship with the world and I don't really feel anything? That's a dangerous place. That I can be severed from the body and I don't feel it? If my hand was severed from my arm and I don't even know it, there's something wrong with me. And so... If I'm, if I'm separated from the body of Christ, it's going to hurt. That's why when we read in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says to turn a man over to Satan. Now, people have argued, well, what does that mean, to turn someone over to Satan? Well, this man was professing to be a Christian, but yet he was living in outright sin. In fact, he was committing fornication, but it was even what the Gentiles weren't even doing, is he was committing fornication with his father's wife meaning it was his stepmother. And Paul rebukes them and says, this is absolutely abominable that you're living this way and you're accepting this. It says, turn this man over to Satan, which meant separate him from the body of Christ. And today, if we would do that, what happens is that person just goes and finds another church that will accept it because the church accepts sin so vividly and violently. But the church today needs to have a standard that there is a standard of God's word. And in this household, I stand upon the Bible and it says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That means to come to Christ means I forsake my old ways. If I'm going to have fellowship with light, we all got to be in the light. Amen? It says in Acts 2.42, it says, And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine of fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayer. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and they all had things in common. It says that they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, to every man that had need, meaning they were helping each other out. If, if, if I saw somebody that was hungry that needed help, I was there to help them. I was there to, to, to do whatever I could do to, to help my brother or sister in need. It says in verse 26, they continued daily. Now, it's hard for Sometimes to find someone that will just come to church on Sunday morning. But they had everyday church, praise the Lord. Every day they were meeting together. They couldn't get enough of one another. Now, my family will tell you, when I'm hanging around somebody too long, I'll start to say things like, uh-oh, they're going to start not liking us. They're going to start being around us too much, and they're going to start to realize, you know what, Lathan's is kind of annoying. So maybe a little bit less of Lathan is better. <laughs> But that's not how they were. They loved one another so much. It was, I can't get enough of each other. Every day they were continuing in one accord in the temple and in breaking bread. They went from house to house. It says they ate meat with gladness and a singleness of heart, praising God. And they had favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And there's, there's many more, but for the sake of time, you can pick this study up as you just do a simple search on the pattern that the early church had. They were continuously meeting together in prayer. The body of Christ, one complete member working together under the head of Jesus. And you see, today, the church has become no more than a social club, 
No more than a, uh, I'll go to church if I feel like it, if the weather's just right. All of these excuses we find. And guys, they ain't going to cut it in the days ahead. As a brother in the Lord said once, the fish bumper sticker on your car ain't going to get you through the days that lie ahead. The days that lie ahead are going to require true and a living faith in this crucified and risen Jesus Christ. We need one another. I need you and you need me. So as we look at, at coming together in fellowship, whether we're in this church or whether we meet at someone's house, whatever the case, it doesn't matter the, the location. What matters is that we're coming together and we're finding the unity that we have in Christ Jesus. I remember who I once was. I heard a brother just the other day preach a sermon, and he said, have you ever looked at the pictures of your before Christ days? And maybe you can think right now of what you, and find a picture before you knew Jesus and what you looked like. And there's times that when I, I mean, I can look at my before Jesus days, and I look at my pictures, and I see who I once was, I can tell a physical difference in me. Fact is, when I got saved, after that, I refused to watch all home videos of myself. You can ask my, my mom and dad. I got saved when I was 16, and I refused to watch any of those videos of myself and whatever I was doing, because it sickened me. Because I could see what I was like, but I didn't know, because I was in darkness. But after I had come into the light and Jesus had changed me, I thought, oh, Lord, thank you for saving me. I don't even want to look at that old man anymore. I thank God he's been crucified with Christ. Amen. And he's not done with me yet, praise the Lord. But we need one another. Remember what you were once like before Christ and how God had brought you so far and delivered you and set you free. And I want to encourage us today. Church is not just a game. It's not just a social club or a meeting. It's not something that we come together here and there or whenever I have time. Church is my lifeline. It's what I cling to because I need you and you need me to keep each other accountable, to keep each other holding fast to the gospel because there's not another way if we lose this one. If we give up now, there's not another cross that's all of a sudden going to appear. There's not another Messiah that's going to come and bring me into the truth. It's already been done and accomplished. And we're in this age right now where we choose. And is heaven worth any loss that I have? You better bet I believe it is. Anything that I sacrifice in this life is going to be well worth it when I see glory. And I don't know in, in full what all heaven has in store for me. But I believe it's wonderful. I believe it's glorious and great. And anything or anyone that I have to abandon in this life in order to clean to what I know the promises of God are, it's going to be worth it. Amen? In closing, I'll share this. When I got saved at 16 years old, I was a young man, and I kind of felt like I had life figured out. I was part owner of a lawn care business, and I know you think, well, you know, there's a lot of kids that mow lawns, but God had actually, well, whether it was God or not, I don't know, but at 16, my cousin and I started a lawn care business. And at 16 years old, we had quite a little bit of pretty big outfit. We were making quite a little bit of money. At only 16 years old, I was uh, making more money than most would think. And I had it all figured out. I mean, I had the finances figured out. I knew that by this time and that time, I was going to have this paid off. And we were going to be getting newer, newer equipment. And I had it all figured out except I was dead inside. And Jesus got a hold of me one night, and I got rid of it all. And I said, I, I can't do this. God has not called me to mow lawns or to plow snow. God has not called me to do landscaping. God's called me to deliver his word and to preach it. And I said, I got to quit, and this is, this is done. And I sold my half of the business to my cousin, which is actually what paid for me to go to Bible college is selling that half of my business to him. And God changed my life completely. Everything that I had fought, I had set forth. God completely turned it around and he set a new way for me. Amen. And I thank God that he's changed my life. And when I got saved, my friends changed, my company changed, my attitude changed, everything changed in me. And my old friends that I used to hang out with would say, what's going on? What's, what's different about you? 
And I couldn't explain all of it, except I knew I couldn't go where I used to go. And the words that I used to say now were a stench in my, in my spirit. The, 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 the things we used to do, it wasn't in me no more to do it anymore because Jesus had changed me from within. So much so that my whole world was flipped upside down. Everything changed in me. And guys, that's what it means to be born again. Just as I was born physically in this life, and they threw a party for me, and everybody was so happy that I was born, and I got a new date that was, you know, my birthday, all of that. I got a name. Guys, when I was born again, the same thing happened in the spirit. There was a date that I was rebirthed. I had a new name written in glory. Amen. I had a new life that was prepared for me. And the old man died and was crucified with Christ. And there's been a new man risen in him. And I need you to help encourage me to stay, stay with this walk with the Lord. Amen. That's the seriousness of church. Neglect not the assembling of ourselves together as some do. Especially as we see the coming of the Lord drawing nearer and nearer. Amen. You bow your heart with me tonight, or this morning, I'm sorry. God has brought each and every one of you here to this place. I believe it with all my heart. In fact, I pray continuously, Lord, bring the people that you want here, draw them. But then I pray this. I say, Lord, those that you don't want here, keep them away. Don't let there be an influence that's negative. Don't let there be anyone here that you haven't called to be here. But Lord, if you're drawing their heart, if you're pulling them, then don't let them escape, but draw them into this place. So that means if you're here today, I believe you are here by divine intervention. I believe God has drawn you here. I believe there is a reason that God wants you here. You are special. You're not just a person in a pew. I believe you are a person that God has called to be here for this time, for this place, for this hour. Whether it's to encourage me or because I got a gospel to preach to you that you need to hear. Either way, we need one another. So I encourage you, be faithful to God. Be faithful to his body. Because even though I got 10 toes and 10 fingers... And I can can live without one or two of them. I don't want to. Even though if you didn't come to church, we'd still make it without you. Because God is the one leading us. I don't want to. I want you here with us. I want you to come and worship with us. And be a part of us. Because we stand better together than apart. So don't take church as a game and I'll just share this there's people who whether they used the virus last year as an excuse not to have to come to church but guys that wasn't even a virus that was just that was really what was in their heart they didn't want to come to church anyway it's just they found a good excuse not to come but those that were hungry there was nothing going to keep them those that were hungry It didn't matter what cost was going to have to be paid. They were like the early church. Even if it meant meeting underground, I will meet. I will gather together because God's told me to. Amen. We would find in the scriptures that Peter was in prison and they were at home meeting and they were praying. And they were scared. There was fear in them because the government had arrested Peter. And all of a sudden a knock on the door comes and a, a young girl leaves the, the prayer session and they she goes to the door and she hears Peter say, it's Peter, open up. She doesn't believe him. She says, no, 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 Peter's in prison. And she runs back in and she tells the rest of the group that we're gathering, guys, there's someone out there who's proclaiming to be Peter, but I know it ain't Peter because Peter's in prison. But what they didn't know is that an angel of the Lord had literally walked into the prison cell and automatically opened up every single gate. And he put blinders on the eyes of the, of the jailers. And Peter walked in the midst of them right out of prison. And the angel of the Lord appeared to, to Peter outside the prison cell. And Peter thought he might have been having a vision. But when he came to outside on the street, he realized this was no vision. This literally happened. 
God sent forth the angel of the Lord and he rescued me. Glory. And he walked into the church that was meeting in their home. And he told them everything that God had done. He gave testimony of how God was working and moving in the midst. Signs and wonders were being done in their, in their midst. Guys, that's the church, the true living church. It's worth meeting when you know that that's the God you serve. When we come together and we worship the Lord, it isn't just some dead song that we're singing to a dead God. And if it is, then we're not born again. But it's a living praise song coming out of a joyful soul that's been redeemed by the blood, singing to a true and living Savior yes. who was dead for me but is now alive. That's the God that I serve. And just as we sang the song Waymaker, guys, I don't know what you're going through today, but God is the way. That He's the God that will make a way for you. I believe it. But the wonderment is, do you truly believe that he's your way maker? Because if you do, you'll surrender it to him. And you'll say, I don't know how it'll work, but I know that God's going to make a way. I got, I don't have time, but guys, I can tell you, Lena and I have had so many things. Whether it was a car broke down and we didn't know how we were going to pay for it. A dishwasher that, or a, a laundry washer, clothes washer, clothes machine. What do you call that thing? that wouldn't wash clothes, stopped working, we didn't have money to buy a new one. We put our hands on that machine and we said, Lord, you're either gonna have to give us a new one or a different one, because the one we got was given to us, or fix this one. Lane and I prayed and she put a load of laundry in it and lo and behold, it started to wash. And it lasted another five years, <laughs> yeah. praise the Lord. And I got testimony after testimony just like that where God has met our needs and our ways. The fact is there was a time where we had no money so much and I was all out of coffee. You know I like coffee. And I said, Lord, we don't even have enough money to go buy coffee. And literally that same hour, my father-in-law showed up with two handfuls of Folgers coffee. And he says, I just had an abundance of coffee and I thought maybe you'd like some. And I just began to thank God that even the little things, God has made a way. And even though I don't need coffee, I can live without it, praise the Lord. God still is that good that he provided everything that I've asked him for. He's my way maker. And you see, you wouldn't hear messages like that if you weren't in church. You wouldn't be reminded of how good God is and how he wants to provide for you and how he wants to meet your need if you chose today to not be here. So that's the importance of church assembling together to be reminded that if you truly are born again, you serve a big God. So ask big and believe that he's able to meet your needs. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and I thank you that you are our way maker. And I know that church is not just a game. It's not just a place to, to gather to, to have fun and food and fellowship and, and to, to just meet and, and mingle, to meet new people. More people come to church because they're looking for a spouse or because they're looking for some excitement. But Lord, that's the wrong reason. I've come to church to meet God. I've come to church to worship the true and living Lord, the Savior of the, of the world. I want to meet with people who love you like I do, who are like-minded and who are, have, been come, have come out of darkness and into your marvelous life. I want to meet with people who love you and are devoted to you and are faithful to, to you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would right now bring a, 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 an encouragement to our hearts today. And, Lord, even though there's people that are out there that, that listen to us over the Internet and they're not within driving distance, they can't come physically to this place, but they feel like-mindedness even over the Internet. And, Lord, you have drawn them Lord, I thank you for them. I thank you for Sister Brenda. I thank you for Sister Paulette. That even though they can't meet with us here, they are here in the Spirit. I pray you bless them, Lord. And that, Lord, that you would encourage us all together in you. 
that we would not lose hope, we would not lose faith and confidence in what you have done, especially as we see your return coming nearer and nearer. Keep us in the faith, Lord God, and continue to draw those that you would have to, to, to be part of us. And those that you would keep away, I pray that you would keep them away, that there would be no hindrance amongst us. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord.